Good morning. I'm Ben Ayers, Dean of the Terry College of Business, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our Terry Third Thursday. We are here at the Terry Exec Ed Center uh, in our relatively newly renovated space. Uh, this is the home of our executive MBA and professional MBA programs, and we also conduct um, open enrollment and custom programs for, through Exec Ed uh, in this space as well, and uh, glad that you're all here. Uh, we're still celebrating the Bulldogs' victory last night over Auburn, so go dogs! <laughs> Anytime you beat Auburn is great. Uh, it doesn't matter what sport it is, uh, even if it's not a sport. Um, so terrific. Uh, let me first let me thank our sponsors. Uh, Sonovus has been a longtime corporate sponsor of this series. Please join me in thanking them for their wonderful support. as well as our two media sponsors, Atlanta Business Chronicle and Atlanta Public Broadcasting, WABE. Please join me in thanking them for their support. <laughs> so upcoming programs on March 19th, we've got Ryan Marshall. Ryan is the president and CEO of Pulte Group. On April 16th, we'll have Ron Domenico. Ron is the executive vice president and CFO of Brinks. And so um, that will be, both of those will be great um, presentations. Uh, it is my pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Mark Spain. Mark is one of our alums from the Terry College in UGA. It's great to have him this morning. He's the chairman and CEO of Mark Spain Real Estate. He is a second generation real estate agent who grew up watching his dad in business and quickly developed a love for homes, landscaping, neighborhoods, customer service, and people in general. After graduating from Terry, he founded a company that focused more on relationships versus transactions, people over money, in order to pursue a passion providing excellence and a desire to deliver an unparalleled client experience. In 2011, after 15 years of practicing real estate, Mark Spain joined Keller Williams and formed the Mark Spain team. Over the following five years, as Mark Spain team helped over 3,500 families close on their homes. So think about that, how many people that is. 2016, he announced independence from Keller Williams and formed Mark Spain Real Estate. 2016 was the group's busiest year yet with a sale of 1,842 homes in that year. Over the next two years, Mark Spain Real Estate opened seven new offices. Three of those were in Charlotte, Raleigh, and Nashville. Last year, Mark Spain Real Estate was named the number one in closed transactions in the United States for the second year in a row by the Wall Street Journal. Mark Spain Real Estate sold over $1 billion in real estate, residential real estate, by assisting over 4,200 families with buying and selling their homes in 2019. And that is incredible. Please join me in welcoming Mark Spain. Thank you. Go dogs, right? It's interesting as I've gotten integrated back into the fabric of UGA over the, really the past year, year and a half. Um, when you're a senior in college, you're anxious to get out, you're ready to get, and I'm probably gonna walk around because I like to pace. You're anxious to get out and you're ready to, ready to get to work. So, and I can remember as a senior in college, I actually started building houses. My family had a family housing business I was in Athens, we were building houses in Loganville and Lawrenceville, and I would drive home from school as a finish manager. So there, there was a guy who took the houses from raw dirt to, to sheetrock, and I had an attention for detail. And my dad was really teaching me how to finish houses and really how to deal with people. And so as a senior in college, I would come home, I'd, go to, I'd have all my classes early in the morning, I would come home, I'd go to Loganville or Lawrenceville, and I would meet the customers and I would help to get those houses finished and go to closing. I didn't really realize what my dad was doing at that time, but he was really teaching me how to just deal with challenges of life and people. And, and I'm gonna give a presentation today, which is 10 Habits to Kickstart Your Business. And it's the same 10 habits that we use to teach our agents and our team members at our company. And at the very end of the presentation, I'm gonna give you two pieces of advice that'll really help you in any area of your life. Um, there's nothing I want to tell you that's sexy. There's, there's no algorithm that I want to teach you. 
although we're a very technology-based company, we're really a relationship-based company, and we help people we help people get onto the next chapter of their life. We also help our agents go from a, a level two, three, four to a level seven, eight, nine, ten. Um, and we're about changing lives. So let's get started with uh, habit number one. So habit number one is to create a daily schedule and stick to it. And when I say that, what I mean is, if you don't, I'm going to back up for a second. A friend of mine told me that one, the one thing that makes the biggest difference in his life is that he wakes up at the same time every day. And we have this guy, he, he's like the number five guy in Northwestern Mutual. He came in and talked to our office a couple of years ago. And it was interesting, when he said that, it was basically, if you, if you wake up, and super successful people wake up at the same time every day. I suspect most of, most of you in this room do. And if you don't learn to control your day, it will control you. And when I'm coaching somebody on my team, I talk about getting up early. I talk about going to the gym every day. And I'm not looking for, a, a, this is not a beauty contest, and I'm not trying to keep their waistlines thin. What I'm trying to do is teach them how to get their day started properly so that they have a very successful day. So create a daily schedule and stick to it. Otherwise, that day is going to take your life over, and you're not, you're not going to have a very productive day. Number two. Open up your calendar. You may go, what does that mean? Well, that means that you've got to be available. And no matter where you're at in your career, sometimes you've got to come into work early. Sometimes you've got to stay late. Because I can tell you in our company, the most successful people are not walking at the door at 525 with their backpacks on going, hmm, All right, you need anything? They do whatever it takes to get the job done. But they also make time for relationships. And so when you open up your calendar and you, and you take the lunches, there's a lot of times that I don't want to take the meeting. There's a lot of times that I don't want to go to that coffee meeting. I don't want to take that phone call. But I can tell you, because relationships matter so much in our business and so much in our lives, and I can tell you that my business throughout my entire career is built on relationships and key pivotal moments when, when we went to that next level, it was because I took the time to spend time with people and I built the relationships. Just like my relationship with Ben. I mean, it, it's, it's a new relationship for me. My relationship with Matt in this room. There are newer relationships, but I've taken the meetings and I've taken the, and they've taken the time to meet with me and you can see what, I, I'm here, right? If I'd have never answered your email or if I'd never, really probably started with Matt in this room. Where's Matt? Yeah, so Matt, does everybody know Matt? You should know Matt. UGA wants you to know Matt. Um, he might ask you for a donation. <laughs> Just saying. But Matt is honestly the reason I'm probably here. It's because I took a meeting with Matt that I honestly, earlier in my career, I would not have taken that meeting. Why? Because I was just on this little rat race of trying to get ahead, get ahead, get ahead, get ahead. And then as I began to mature in my leadership, I realized how important relationships were. Although my parents gave me a good foundation, but there was a period that I was just on this rat race of trying to close that next deal and close that next deal. So I can't stress to you enough to take the time to make the meetings. Be productive with your time, control your day, but take the meetings. Number three. This is probably one of the most important habits that you can ever learn in your life. And I'll say probably the older people in the room probably know this better than anybody, but who you hang around with matters. And you hear this a lot and you're like, yeah, it's just whatever. But if you're in sales and you want to be a $5 million producer, should you hang around $3 million producers? No, you should be hanging around $10 million producers. If you're a $10 million producer, you should be hanging around $20 million producers. And the reason is because success leaves clues. And people who are more successful than you will teach you things. And a lot of times, it's not by what they say, it's by what they do. Because successful people have habits, and you watch what those people do, and you watch how those people behave, and they'll teach you things. So I can't stress to you enough to pay attention who you hang around with. If you've got teenagers, pay attention who they hang around with. And as you're an adult, it's the same thing. Number four. Let me grab me a sip of water. So get very clear on your big why. 
And I'm sure you've heard this before. But what that means is, and I'll tell you, this has been the rocket fuel of my career. Because I used to say, and this is my wife calling BS on me. I'll just get real clear here. I used to say, I, honey, I work really hard for the family. And she would say, you're, you're full of it, honey. You work hard because you want to win. You want to get ahead. You would flip hamburgers and deliver pizzas for our family. You'd dig ditches for our family. And she's right. But being in the South, I used to think that I had to be so politically correct that I would always say the things that I thought people wanted me to, wanted me to say and wanted to hear. And when I got really clear, and, and, and this is very pivotal for me, is, is in 2012, I was in coaching, and my coach helped me really understand who I really was at my core and what it really meant to me. And honestly, I just want to frickin' win. And my big why is I want to win, and I want to win in a bad way. Not at all cost, but I'll, I'll outwork anybody in this room. I'll outwork anybody in this state. And I realized that, and once I got really clear that it was my why, and I didn't have to apologize for who I was, and I might offend some people, and I didn't go around talking about it, but it got me, it really became the rocket fuel in my career. And at that time, I was with Keller Williams. And there was a guy who always beat me. He was from Katy, Texas. I can remember to this day. And, and honestly, when I, I was at REMAX for my first 10 years of my career, and I was always other number two and number three in the country in production. This guy from Katy, Texas, he would always be number one. So I said, you know what? I'm changing companies. So I went to Keller Williams. And son of a gun, did he not follow me. <laughs> I'm like, are you kidding me? He's going to come over too? And so in, to, in 2012, I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you the story and the backdrop. In 2012, I was number one in the company all the way uh, back up. I became number one in the company in April, and I was number one all the way through November. And son of a gun, the dang guy from Katy, Texas, surpassed me in November 2012 to beat me. And I said, you know what? That year I closed 649 transactions. He closed like 711. I said he's not going to do it again. So I did some research. I found out nobody in America had closed over 1,000 houses. No, no real estate agent or team had closed over 1,000. So in 2013, I went to my team, and I said, here's the deal. We're going to close over 1,000 houses in 2013. By the way, in 2012, I was number two. Number two, in, it's number two in the world with Keller Williams, which was the largest real estate company in the world at that time. And I said, I got I to gotta create a big enough number that I can, nobody can beat me. Again, my big one is winning. My, I, I literally went to my team like this in a, in a, in a group setting, and I said, hey, we're going to be number one in the world in closed transactions, sales volume, commissions earned, and we're going to close 1,000 transactions. Literally, later on that year, my team thought I was crazy. We closed only 640 something transactions, 649 in 2012. By the way, we're in a deeper session. Remember? 2012, if y'all don't remember my business, it was rough. We were selling a lot of $37,000 condos for banks. So that year we closed over 1,400 transactions. So we went from, we almost doubled our business during a recession. And what really, what really propelled, propelled me was my big one, is I got really clear on who I was. And I didn't make any more apologies for it. And if you don't know what your big why is, I, sh I, I encourage you to spend some time thinking about it. And, and you can usually figure it out by dreaming, thinking about your goals, thinking about what makes you tick. And it can't be my why, it can't be your wife's why, it has to be you. So, so learn to understand who you are and ask people really close to you what makes you tick. Because, and by the way, it usually cannot be money. It could be, I want to make a million dollars and what you're going to do with that money because at the end of the day, money is just the vehicle, right? It's what you do with it that's important. So just, I want to make that point because I'm economically motivated, but it's more important what you're going to do with that money. Otherwise, it's just a really shallow goal. Number five, set big goals, which we kind of talked about that. Again, I'm in a deeper session, and I went from 649 transactions to 1,000. That was a pretty freaking big goal. And the reason why you don't set baby goals or small goals, 
because big goals create big habits. I would rather somebody on my team say, hey, I'm going to close 100 houses this year and only get to 85 than I would to tell me they're going to get to 75 and get to only reach 73. Because when you set big goals, you create a subconscious thing and you create habits in your life to get you there. And, and over time, it, you, you, you'd be surprised how big you grow. Number six. I mean, do the work. Sounds really simple, right? But you'd be surprised, and maybe you wouldn't be surprised if, since you're all in business, how many people want to skip to the VP level or the CEO level or the COO level or the CFO level, but they don't want to do the work. And unfortunately, there's no really secret to the top except doing the frickin' work. And what, what's the secret to my success? Is I had really good parents that taught me work ethic. I'm very competitive. I don't like to lose. And I'll outwork anybody in this room. Not that you're not hard workers. I'm just saying if you get up at 5 o'clock, I'll get up at 4. If you get up at 4, I'll get up at 3. Because why? Because my big why is telling me that I do not want to lose. I want to win in a big way. And you got to do the work. Um, I know it sounds simple, but there is no shortcut. And I'm sorry that I'm not here to tell you today there is a shortcut, there is not one. Number seven, approach your day with gratitude. Well, just like I started out here today thanking Ben for bringing me here and thanking everybody who, who came, came today, being grateful for just the opportunity to be here, being grateful that you live in America, the greatest country on earth. I mean, when you wake up every day with gratitude and you appro approach every opportunity with gratitude, your mindset changes and your life becomes easier. And things just kind of run a lot smoother in your life. So just approach every day with gratitude. Number eight. We teach people in our company to be leaders without a title. Especially when I have an emerging person coming into my office, an emerging talent, and says, hey, I want to reach, I want to become a sales manager. I want to become a ISA manager. Well, we want people in our company and we want to see them lead without a title. They, forget, there's a lot of people who just like the VP role, who like the manager role, who like the director role. Again, they don't want to do the work. So a lot of times we like to test people and we like them just to lead certain things in our company without a title. Screw titles, right? I actually, mine's a CEO title. I don't even like the title. I don't, I don't like titles at all. I actually asked my marketing department one time, can they just take the titles off the door because you want to be approachable, right? Number nine, read, read, read. Um, w one of my favorite books right now is called The CEO Next Door. Has anybody read this book? It's an awesome book. Caitlin, who's our digital marketing manager, she's here today. And, and her, 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 I don't even like to use the word, her leader is Alicia. She's our VP of marketing. She's here as well. And it's interesting that in our company, you got to read a lot. And I always say, you know, one or two books a month. Alicia's a lot tougher than me. And Caitlin has made it. Caitlin made it. But I think, by the way, Caitlin's from Terry, too. Um, but Alicia makes her read like a book a week. I'm like, Alicia, calm down. I don't know what it is, right? But you know, you know, the thing is, the cool thing about Caitlin is she reads the books and she sends like these. We call them ahas. We like when somebody reads a book in our company. We like to we like to like share ahas. What what did you learn with the book? And so she has great ahas, and I use that as an example because Caitlin is a on a fast path of growth with our company, and she is a, a she's super intelligent. I mean, usually when you come from Terry, you are super intelligent, but she and but but in our company, you have to read. And thank goodness my parents taught me at a young age to read. Not, not to just read from like the basics of reading, but like what the, what the value is of reading. Because in, I was in sports as a kid. And so that's kind of where my competitive background comes from is sports. And my dad had me reading stuff like The Psychology of Winning at 14 when I, from Dr. Dennis Whateley. At 15, I, my dad said, hey, you need to read this great book, How to Win Friends and Influence People by you know, Carnegie. And so. Thank goodness my parents taught me that stuff. 
So as, I, as I'm 48 years old today, it's, it's really not a secret to my parents that I'm successful because they were instilling all these values in me at an early age and saying, hey, do the work, treat people right, build relationships, and read. It, and it sounds kind of cheesy, but readers are leaders. Number 10, don't allow distractions to become obsessions. And you go, hmm, what does that mean? Well, if you're a young leader and you want to become a manager, or if you're a manager and you want to reach the director level, can you become a professional golfer at the same time? Nothing wrong with golf. Can you be on six tennis teams? Can you be addicted to Instagram? Can you be on Facebook all day? No, you can't. And sometimes when we have people coming into our organization, it's hard to break those habits. It's hard to say, you know, it, 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 it's caught in an alignment thing. So I have a young leader coming in, and they want to they become a manager. But I also know what their calendar looks like, and they're playing golf three days a week. And there's nothing wrong with golf, because I love golf. But he's not going to reach the top on a fast track if he's out playing golf every day at 4 o'clock. Because you, right, you got to do the work. You can't be on Facebook all day and be prospecting at the same time. So just be very, very careful of what you're obsessed with. And just remember, you can't have it all. So that's the 10 habits that we teach leaders at our company. Is we teach every agent at our company. But I'm going to give you two pieces, of, two pieces of advice that have made the most impact on my life. Although those are the basic components of, of the habits. But it's really, if you remember two things when you leave here, it's these two pieces, these two pieces of advice I'm going to give you right here today. Number one is, if you're, if you're unhappy in any area of your life, if you're unhappy in any area of your life, you're missing a person. And so my mentor, Gary Keller, the founder of Keller Williams, which I was blessed enough to be mentored under him for five years, taught me that advice. Number one is you can't fix people. So if you're working for me, and I'm constantly bringing you in my office, and I'm trying to fix you, I got a problem. Unfortunately, you got to fix yourself. And so if I'm, not re if I'm not reaching a target in an office, I usually have a person problem. But, but this premise that I'm telling you, if you're unhappy in any area of your life, you're missing a person. It's just like in, in Caitlin, Caitlin coming into our office. I didn't grow up in a digital age, by the way, 48 years old. We didn't have the internet in college. And so what did I do? We went out and hired somebody who's a lot younger than me, who grew up in, and she knows nothing but the digital age of, of, of the world. And she's a savant at digital marketing, and that's why we brought her in. But if you're unhappy in any area of your life, if you're unhappy in your finances, go see a financial counselor. If you're unhappy in, any, in, in your marriage, go see, a, go see a, finan I mean a marriage counselor. If, you're in, if you have religious problems or spiritual issues, you might need to see a priest. If you have health issues, eating habit issues, you may need to see a nutritionist. This area, this, that piece of advice will apply to every single area of your life. If you're trying to reach a new market and that person is not getting it, more than likely in that market center, you got a, you've got a person problem, not a market problem. 99% of the time in all problems of your life is always going to be a person issue. I can't stress that enough. And that's how we built our business. How do we go from a single agent person at Keller Williams or Remax to all of a sudden having eight offices in three different states, closing over 4,000 homes? We found the right people. I have a great life. I'm blessed. I carry a lot of responsibility. We have no debt. We have no bank loans. We have no investors. We've done it all on a bootstrap budget. But how did we do it? We did it with the right people. And I'm telling you, if you, if you put any pressure on your business or any pressure in your work teams, put pressure on finding the right people. I was fortunate enough. And you can see it through the trajectory of my career. In about 2011, 12, you could see that our business changing really fast because I began to put more and more pressure on my hires. So if you're a leader or manager, that's where you need to spend most of your focus is on hiring the right people. I, can't, I mean, your life will change very fast 
and it doesn't take 50 people in a company to make a big difference, it usually only takes one or two key people to change your world. I mean, think of the major companies in the world. It doesn't mean that you don't need an army of people to get the job done, but in Microsoft, there's only one or two key people. In Apple, there's only one or two key people. So think about that when, you, when you're making hiring decisions. Slow down the hiring process. Take, I mean, I'm thinking of Caitlin because she's sitting in front of me. Caitlin, how long did it take us to hire you? She probably was like, what the frick is the matter with you people? But do you know what the cost of a bad hire is? Go back and do the math. Go back and do the math in your company and figure out the cost of a bad hire. How disruptive is it on the company to have to pluck somebody out? And you're not only doing them an injustice, you're doing the people in your company injustice because you hired them. And it's okay to, uh, I, I own the worst hires in our company. Yeah, I'm humble enough to admit it, but I also learn and I spend time, and, you, and you, sometimes I'm still gonna get it wrong, but I spend a lot of time courting the right people for key hires. The next and final piece of advice I'm gonna give you is, and fortunately, and this, this was, this is something my parents instilled in me as, as, as a teenager. The amount of time you spend on personal development is a direct reflection on the trajectory of your success. I'll say that again. The amount of time you spend on personal development will have a direct correlation to the trajectory of your success. So if you're in sales and you wanna double your income in 2020, double or triple the amount of time you spend on yourself. And the problem is with most people, they want to, again, they want to come in and shortcut to the VP level. But they don't want to continue to work on themselves. So when somebody, a young person, or it could be any age person, comes in our, my office and wants some advice, usually they're going to leave with a book. Or they're going to leave, I'll age myself, a set of, a set of CDs, a set of Jim Rome CDs, a set of Zig Ziglar CDs, something to really help them because if you work, and instead they want to like say all the problems are here. And instead, and fortunately, my dad humbled me all the time. The problem was always here. Because if I wanted to, if I wanted to fix the world, I had to fix myself. I had to work on myself. And I just knew that every time I hit a plateau, in my, if you're if you're in this room and you've hit a plateau in your career and you've kind of flatlined, and I can see these flat lines in my career when I look at look at the numbers. It's because I wasn't spending more time working on me. Whether it be coaching, whether it be reading more books, whether it be going to more seminars, whether it be any podcasts, you've got to work on yourself. If you want to double your income, double the amount of time you spend learning, reading, studying. I know that I haven't told you anything that's sexy, right? There's not one sexy thing in this room, and I can tell you that any successful person will tell you the same thing that I'm telling you. You gotta do the work, you gotta read the books, you gotta put in the time. I'm gonna open it up for questions to the room. Uh, just any, any question, anybody have any questions? Hey Mark, uh, my question comes when you were talking about hiring um, you spoke a lot about the importance of it. What traits or what characteristics are you really looking at when making a hiring decision? So it depends on the job. So what you don't want is a square peg in a round hole. And so we use all types of different behavior profiles. So like if you went online and applied for a job with our company, you're gonna get a person, you know, send your resume, fill up your form, you're gonna get a person, that's stage one of personality test. And then, then we're gonna go to take it to the next step level and we do, do like, a, like a behavioral assessment through like a, an industrial psychologist. And, and we're basically, we have what we call job descriptions and they, in our world it's called a jar. And we just say, hey, if Caitlin is the rock star as the sales agent, we want more people like her. So over the years, we've created a baseline of what that behavior needs to look like. Because the worst thing that you can, and honestly, like the, a job that me and you may not like and that we would just struggle every day. There's another person in this room that gets up every day and is so excited. And they wake up every day just wanting to do whatever that is, maybe door knocking, cold calling, who knows what it is. 
but just making sure that the behavior fits the profile. And so like, I'll give an example, it's a couple of traits. So like if you're gonna be a sales leader in our company, number one is you better be economically motivated, which means that you better be driven by wanting to make a lot of money. Because the worst thing I could do is hire a sales leader who's not economically motivated. Why? Because they're gonna get to that $100,000 or $150,000 level and stop. Do you think as a business owner I want anybody in any office I have stop? No. And so you just have to, does that make sense to you? And so there's, there's a lot of science to it. There's a lot of behavioral profile companies out there in, in, in the world that you should use, but you should never go by gut feeling. You should never go, you should use data. But, you know, data doesn't lie. So you would say it's, you would want to lead with personality and then kind of go from there? Personality gets you, you know, a ticket to the dance. And then you, and sometimes those tests, the, the beginning tests are kind of, they're basically very inexpensive, so people could cheat on them. And then we bring you in and then we, we validate them. I want to make sure that the way you answer the test is, is, is truthful. And then we have other tests that are a lot, you know, that are going to two and three and four hundred dollar test type stuff. It's hard to cheat it. But again, just making sure the behavior, the behavior matches. You don't, like you don't want to hire a salesperson that's quiet and shy. And it's like, yeah, this might be terrible. You want to have somebody that's, they don't have to be the life of the party, but they have to have relational abilities to sell things. Spend time studying it. There's a book called uh, The Rare Find. It's a great book. You should probably read that. It teaches you how to, I look for things that are called the outliers. I look for things that people have a chip on their shoulder, what drives them, whether it could be maybe they were a college athlete. Maybe, I don't look for the perfect Harvard MBA guy, I can tell you that. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I'm not that guy. I look for somebody who's got a little bit of edge. Next question. Hi, uh, so I was wondering why, when you sort of got that number one spot and got all the success with Keller Williams, what was your motivation for going independent and sort of, you know, going off your, your safe track that you had going with Keller Williams? Well, fortunately, I had a leader that was mentoring me that always told me I was thinking too small. And he would just constantly come over to me and just kind of poke me. Because I, I, he knew it kind of would bother me with him doing that. It would kind of created this trigger, so that's one thing. Um, and I always wanted to be, have my own thing, my own asset. So I had a really safe income stream, safe business within, like a, when you're in a real estate company, sometimes it's like an insurance company, you have your own book of business, they're not giving you leads, and it's safe. So my wife told me, she goes, well honey, you can stay safe, and I always wonder if you could have made it on your own, or you could be pushed out of the nest and get after it, that's one thing. The other thing was, and we didn't really talk about this, but during 2012, I literally left my company and I went to work for Blackstone. So my company's still running. I launched Invitation Homes here in Atlanta. I was the regional head. And so that was a tipping point in my career when I was hanging around all these somewhat billionaire type guys and I watched the way they thought. And I thought, hmm, I thought I was super successful. I always number one, two, three in the company kind of your flex in your chest. But then when you start, it goes back to that habit I was telling you about, who you hang around with matters, all of a sudden I was looking like, wait a minute, these guys are making $100 million, $500 million, they're worth a billion dollars, they're worth $2 billion, and I'm this little dude over here. Who you hang around with matters, and all of a sudden I said, wait a minute. So I, I worked for Invitation Homes for, and launched it in, during 2012. That got my brain thinking in a totally different way. So I had a mentor pushing me, hanging around the people at Blackstone, made me think a lot different about what's possible. Thank you. You're welcome. R right here, Mark. Hello. Oh, I was like, man, we're going to switch it up a little bit. <laughs> My question has more to do with today's marketplace. Um, are you, is your company seeing challenges from the influx of all the iBuyers that are now in Atlanta? And if so, what kind of actions are you taking to adapt to those new challenges? Yeah, so the question is, and so, so, so we'll, you all understand what the question is. So basically, are there challenges that I'm dealing with and facing in our industry, which most every industry is facing challenges with competition, with tons of venture capital money, tons of Wall Street money, and yes. And it is, it, it's real. 
But if you pay attention, you see around corners. And if you ever, if anybody notices what we do in our business, and if anybody pays attention in Atlanta to any of our marketing, we, we essentially are an iBuyer. And so, again, it goes back to that competitiveness. Nobody's going to come in my town and try to take over my space. Nobody's going to come on my radio station. I call on my radio station, WSB in Atlanta. That's my radio station, <laughs> by the way. Nobody's going to come in my town and take over my radio ads. So rather than crawl in a hole when competition comes in, and by the way, none of my competition makes any money. They've never made, never made a profit in their life. We have no debt. We have to make money to pay our bills. And so I just got really competitive. And we were already really doing an iBuyer before an iBuyer was cool. Because I already had institutional clients, Imitation Homes, Blackstone, Amber. I had all these clients that were my clients. We were sourcing properties for them, meaning that when we would take a listing, we would sell it to all these groups anyway. And so all I did was, again, I paid attention way early before it was cool, and I started flying out to Phoenix and meeting. Most of the guys that started these companies were my friends. But all the guys who started Offer Patent Group, they're, they're, they were my Blackstone friends. So I just flew out and hung out with them. I met them. Remember that relationship piece? So I, they, they gave me the clues and the answers to the test of what was happening in the industry because things start on the West Coast, usually move south and then east, and then, then up north. And so I studied it. We pivoted our business model early on, long before anybody else in Atlanta was doing it. I got my message and my positioning. Great marketing book, by the way, if you want to read it. It's called Positioning by Al Rees. And we prevented anybody from taking market share of us. And, and what we did was we grew as a, as a result of it. Our business in, from 2018 to 19 was up 66%. Why? Because we were able to pivot early, lock down our position before anybody came into our town and started trying to bump us out. Again, these are all companies backed by billions of dollars in funding. We don't have that. Next question. Yes. Um, hi. I'm, so I'm a current student, and so I was just wondering, what advice do you have for young professionals just starting out um, and kind of finding a mentor and establishing that relationship and convincing more established professionals to invest their time and energy into you? A couple of things. First of all, make sure you do internships. I can't stress that enough. And I have a 20-year-old daughter. And so as I'm talking to her about internships, um, I'm like, don't take an internship and, to, and same thing with our company. Don't take an internship if you're not interested in joining that company. It doesn't mean you have to do it, but it's a way to, go, to integrate yourself. And just say you want to go into the ad business, marketing, ad agency. If you want to pick an agency that you like, do enough read, study, not just take the first one, study 10, 15, 20 of them and find the one you really want to go after and make sure that you would actually take the job if they offered it to you. If it, because an internship is dating on both sides. So that's number one. And number two is just look in your, look, look in your, look in your circles. Look around you with your parents, friend, like anybody around you that you, want, that you want to aspire to be like. So like just pretend like, just say your mom's best friend is a CFO at wherever. That's, that's where I would start because it's an easier relationship because they already know you. And trust me, successful people love, 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 ask, you know, people who aspire to do better, especially younger people. I like all types of people, but I love somebody who's young, who's hungry and thirsty, because I can tell you in my career, I would go meet with all types of builder owners, real estate brokerage owners in my 20s, because I wanted to do better, and they would always take the meeting. It's rare that, a, that a, an adult might not take a meeting with another adult, but they'll take a meeting with a younger person. Strange, but it works. Because why we want to see people succeed. We want to see people who do better because guess what? We didn't get here alone. Somebody helped tons of, you hear me talk about other people. People helped me. And I'll and read, study, read some more, study. And I guarantee Ben will tell you to read more. Thank you. Next question. In the back of the room. Here. Either front or back. Um. So I told my wife I was coming to see Mark Spain this morning, and she said, oh, fantastic. Tell him 
that I love what he does on uh, the fish for the annual make a wish uh, for the fish. And so I was just curious, big picture wise, with all your success, how do you go about thinking about charitable giving, philanthropy, you know, giving back to the community and so on? Awesome question. So what do we do to get back and how do we decide to where we plug in? So first of all, there's, there's a book called Give and Take that you should read too. It's by Grant. It's, it's an awesome book. It talks about strategic giving and what that means. Again, the book's called Give and Take. And so again, it goes back to my mentor, Gary Keller, who really pushed me to be a giver and to be a strategic giver and to basically go all in on one organization. And so if you give $250 or $100 to like 17 different organizations, or have you made any impact? Maybe barely on those organizations, but there's no strategy in, the, in your strategic giving. And so for us, we wanted to, and you gotta give where your heart is. And so for us, and for really personally to me, it's kids. And kids, to me, kids do not have a choice of what environment they're born into. They're not, they don't choose whether they're in a very successful family or below the poverty line. And the number one segment of society is single women with children, by the way. And so we did some things with some different um, housing complexes that were really focused on women with children. And then as we kind of went through this path trying to figure out exactly where we wanted to go, we got really plugged in to the YMCA. And it was an easy platform for us. We, I became a chairman of uh, the Spinathon, which is an annual event. We're in the middle of, we're in the middle of our fundraising right now. And we basically raised money for children to go to summer camp. And summer camp is a big deal for kids. You may not realize if you don't know who ever went to summer camp, you would probably realize how important it is. But one in five kids at a YMCA summer camp, or really at a YMCA in general, is on a scholarship, by the way. And so we raise enough money to send a couple hundred kids a year to summer camp. That's part one. We raise the money right now through the Spinathon event. And then we shut down our company for an entire day in May, and over 100 of our employees go out and fix up the camp. We call it waking up the camp at our big Y day on Lake Lanier and wake the camp up for the children. And then part of my thing with the fish, again, it's strategic, is we always, you, you, you'll never hear me pick a family that's not a single woman with children. And every year, that's what we've chosen. And so we're, we're, we're really plugged into the fish. Um, there's, a, there's a strategy there. And it also, part of giving that you don't really realize is what it does for the giver. It makes you feel amazing, and it's like doing the right thing. It's great for your organization because your organization don't want to, doesn't want to see you as just a taker. They, they love you to be a giver. It's, it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a cool thing. And I was, we, my parents were always great and givers, but not to the level that we are today, and it was really because of my mentor. Next question. Um, mine's also about mentorship. I'm older than she is. I have my own 20 year old, um, but you need mentors as you go through life. And my question is, did you always personally ask people like you were just saying, did you ever have mentors where you joined maybe a training program and they became your mentor or how, how did you find them? And when I was younger looking for them, I asked a lot of people and some people said yes, but all of them weren't very good. So how do you know, especially when you're younger, who to latch on to? And, and definitely choose your mentor wisely, but pay attention to what their life's like. If they're at the bar every day at 535, that's probably not who you want to mentor. If they're at a golf course at Wednesday, Thursday, Friday at noon, that's, pro that's not really what you're looking to be like because that gives you a false sense and misalignment of where you're trying to, to get to. Um, and it, there, there's a chance somebody's going to say no. And if they say no, fine. Just ask them a, ask them a piece of advice for a, whatever age you are. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be young. I just, and just for me, so I had a really, so I had a, a, I had an awesome parent. My dad was my mentor. So I, was, I was blessed. Call it luck or whatever you want to. I was, I was very blessed to have an awesome dad who was an entrepreneur who taught me a lot. And so that was my early years of a career. But then his best friend, Joe Fitz, who's no longer with us, 
was the leader of Brace and Holmes, which is a large ranch builder in Atlanta, the largest ranch builder in Atlanta for years. His son works for us now. He, he became my mentor. And so it was one of my, it's that st strategic thing, it was my dad's friend. And how it worked out is I had a neighborhood that I was sitting in, and he would just come visit me. And I was like, wait a minute. He keeps coming and visiting me and asking me questions because he actually wanted information from my neighborhood. I'm like, this could actually work out for me. And I just started befriending him, and we'd go to lunch and breakfast, and I would say, hey, can you teach me? I would just ask really bold questions. How do I get to the next level? What should I be working on? Who should I be studying? And he would just teach me. And then as my path went like this, I joined Keller Williams, and it just happened to be I was a top producer, and the leader wanted to be, me to be in his group. Then when I left Keller, I had this void, right? I was like, well, what, what, what am I going to do? And so I had some older, older, I usually, for me personally, this is my personal thing, I usually pick older men as my mentor. Usually 60 years old or older. I'm 48. And I, I pick them because they're going to teach me wisdom that I don't know today. Because from 48 to 60, from 48 to 70, there's this gap that I need to, I don't, I've never been there, so I need to learn from them. And so there's two or three guys. One is a guy named Robert Locke that I used to, he used to, he owned Crown Property Management that Realogy eventually bought out. So he, we go to breakfast about, you know, three, four times a year. Another is David Chatham. I don't know if anybody knows David Chatham. Chatham Holdings, big, huge real estate developer, developed a lot of Wynwood Parkway. Uh, he, he, he and I go to lunch every quarter. And then I wasn't going to have that monthly thing that I had with Gary Keller anymore, and that was a big deal for me. It was kind of my glue that when I was at KW. So I went and hired a coach. So I hired a CEO coach that would help me. So that give you, it's, it's, a, it's a real broad perspective, but you can see I'm very strategic and I'm not just coasting through life hoping I get to the other side because I always want to be better. I'm, I'm never going to make it. I haven't made it today because somebody's always doing better, knows, has more wisdom. And I'm not necessarily going, hey, how can I make more money? I'm like, hey, because when I meet with my mentors, you know what the things they're telling me at my age? Mark, how's your relationship with your wife? Are you spending time with your kids? What time are you getting home from work? Are you staying out of debt? Are you living a low lifestyle? Things are great now, man. Are you saving money? What are you doing? And that's what I need. That's, that's where I want my, I, that's the people I want teaching me. Not somebody that's saying, hey, I've never met with one of my mentors in the last two years that says, hey, you need to make more money, Mark. Which is, I'm sure that probably sounds kind of wow. No, that's not what they're teaching me because that's not what I'm trying to learn right now. I'm trying to learn how to be a better husband, be a better dad, be a better leader, just be a better person. Yes, sir. I want to ask you about your marketing strategy. You, I think you advertise more than all the real estate companies combined and you I'm glad you noticed <laughs> you referred to WSB as your radio station so talk a little bit about your strategy in marketing and so I'm glad you asked I'm glad you asked about marketing it's because my degrees in management specifically productivity management and I just love freaking marketing I love I'm an advertising junkie I reach I just love marketing, advertising, I just happen to be in the real estate business. And so my strategy is I don't want anybody to ever think about anybody except me. <laughs> it's not personal. And so you hear people in this room, the fish, WSB. And so when I go to, when I go to buy media, and by the way, I love to negotiate. I'm a professional negotiator. And I think my media outlets would tell you that. And I like to buy a ton of frequency. I like to make sure that anytime you turn on that station, so like how, how radio and TV and billboards work, so for instance, radio, same people listen to WSB every single day. And by the way, if you drove from North Atlanta or South Atlanta today, you were in your car for an hour to two hours. And you're gonna hear me two or three or four or five, 50 times, I don't know, a lot. And so what I do is I've studied positioning I've created a positioning. I have a simple marketing message. Not 70, I'm not trying to sell 75 items. and all. We offer a lot of products, but I, 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 the widest funnel, the widest product with the widest funnel, and I'm selling one product. And I want to own that position in the consumer's mind. And so whether I'm on the fish, WSB, 
KISS, it doesn't matter, WSB TV, you're gonna see me own all types of real estate assets on that, those stations, so that anytime somebody, if a competitor comes on, I already have the asset. I already have Scott Slade, you can't get him. And whether I needed him or not, I got him because I don't want you to have him. <laughs> Did I tell you I'm competitive? No. Next question. Oh, I'm lucky. Good morning, Fred no Curry. Uh, Fred Curry, MBA class of 2010. Um, number six is do the work. Um, and, and about a week ago, I got a chance to hear uh, Steve Ewing, who's the CEO of uh, Wade Ford, talk about like the whole trajectory of his career. And he talked about like his failures, like when he failed, essentially had a dealership that had shut down. And we know you you're very successful. He's very successful. You're very successful. But can you talk about a time? where you know you did the work but the results didn't seem to come right away so some of my biggest failures I'm not sure about doing the work some of my, my my biggest failures whatsoever is I hired the wrong person and I spent tons of time maybe I, I can think of one person I had a, I had a really long term relationship with this person. I knew this person. They had more production than anybody in our company. And I hired them and it was like such a farce and I had to take ownership. And so as a leader, I think number one is when you make a mistake, you go fix the mistake. I don't say Alicia go fix that for me. If I made the mistake, humility is a big deal in leadership. Humil humility is a big deal in life, right? Humility as a parent is a big deal. Be humble enough Check your ego at the door and go fix the problem. And know that you're going to make mistakes, man. My, my, it's like Michael Jordan. It looks like he's just had no issues. He's had tons of issues. We all have. By the way, everybody in this room has issues. I have issues. Okay, we all have issues. Success is not like this. It's messy. There's a lot of messy stuff in the middle. It looks like all of a sudden we're growing leaps and bounds. It looks like maybe we're some overnight success. We, I've been in business for 22 years. It's just the last five years that I really got my act together. It's, if you look at the trajectory of my success, it's really since like, really the middle of the recession, I really kind of got really thinking of started hanging around the right people and kind of got put in this path. And if you're not sure you're doing the right work, I mean, that's where your mentor comes in place. And so you're, I mean, I was, I've been fortunate enough that I've had mentors that kept me on this path. But there's plenty of times that we, came up with a product that we thought was just gonna be a home run that just failed. There's plenty of times where I went and spent money on radio stations that didn't work. But one thing that we're really good at at our company is data. If you don't know your numbers and your business, you're in trouble. There's a competitor gonna take you down. Because data doesn't lie and data tells you the numbers. The amount of money I spent on marketing is tremendous. And why am I able to do it and some of my other competitors aren't outside of the venture back companies? Why did we get to where we are? Because I had I always had data. The data doesn't lie. The data tells me where my, every night at nine o'clock, I get a report. By the way, we're a completely technology data driven company. Every piece of our business is connected to a software called Salesforce. It tells me everything about our company at any time that if I wanna pull up my phone and find any piece of data in our company, from response time in our ISA department, which by the way is 26 seconds. So if you fill out a form on our website and within 26 seconds, we're calling you back. You're still at your computer going, what the heck is going on? I just put the form. <laughs> Why? Because I don't want you to call another competitor. And by the way, if I had waited five minutes, you're all the way getting your kid to soccer practice. So I only have a couple of minutes to get you. Our leads are incredibly expensive. We spend so much money on marketing and advertising, I have to know immediately if something's not working or not. Because we call it in our business, whack-a-mole. So maybe in a market you have 10 or 15 different things, you're work 10 or 15 different marketing outlets. They don't all work perfect, by the way. There's no marketing book and there's no college you can go to that teaches you everything perfection about marketing and you just read this book and go do the work. It's not like that. It's always changing, it's whack-a-mole. And data doesn't lie, so know your numbers. But my biggest mistakes, really, outside of hiring, and I don't even know, I don't call them mistakes because I don't look at it like that. I look at them as just learning opportunities. We just bought the wrong media. We didn't understand the data better enough. Or we had all the data and it showed perfection and it didn't work. 
because every, by the way, we're in eight different markets, and every market's not the same. You know, it's just like I thought I was going to go into Athens, Georgia, and be this big hero, and take my same marketing message in Atlanta as the big time at big city dude to the small town Athens. I have an office in Athens, by the way. That was a total failure. I spent a tremendous amount of money trying to figure it out. And what I finally realized, I'm trying to take big city and cram it into a small town. That doesn't work. So what I did is I got with our research team and I said, how can I take Mark Spain, Snellville, small town dude, and plug him into Athens? I gotta have this connection. So we met with our research group at Cox, Cox Media helped us put together a little panel. We were going through, can we get Vince Dooley? Well, his wife's a real estate agent. She, that probably won't work. She is, by the way. Um, Barbara. And could we, so I said, wait a minute. I went to South Gwinnett High School. There's this guy named David Green that went to South Gwinnett High School. We could be like buddies. So I said, I think my pest control company, relationships, my pest control company knows David Green. I've heard him talk about it. They brought me a football sign bomb. So I texted my pest control company, got David Green on the phone. David Green became my endorser in Athens, Georgia. I bought every single radio station I could in Athens. David and I recorded, recorded media together. David and I became like this duo for Athens, Georgia, and he talked about us growing up in Snellville together. So connection from hometown South Gwinnett to UGA. Next thing you know, doing 30, 40 deals a month in Athens. But I spent a lot of money to figure that out. And I knew it wasn't working, by the way. I just didn't know why. Well, thank you all for having me today. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Matt. Everybody put this together. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. It's an honor to be here. I hope you've gotten a lot of value out of it. And I hope you have an amazing day. And I wish you the best of success. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for investing your time with us today. Very proud of you and your success, and uh, really appreciate your words of wisdom. Oh, no, thank you, sir. I appreciate you. Oh, thank you very much. So nice red and black sculpture by Loretta Eby to mark today's uh, presentation and give you a constant reminder of Materia College. Go dogs.